uh, address from our keynote speaker. Uh, I'm sure that Professor Starkey needs no introduction, but I will introduce you, uh, David. Uh, Professor David Starkey, um, of course, is, I think, I think I'm right in saying, uh, principally uh, known to us as a historian of the 16th century uh, and the wider and the modern period, uh, but someone whose learning and whose interests and whose writing uh, range over a, a much wider terrain than that. Uh, recently, uh, particularly with a, a flourishing uh, presence in broadcasting and, and commentating on many areas of interest, but particularly from the perspective uh, of the history of England. Um, it's a great joy to me um, that uh, Professor Starkey, who I've got to know a little uh, more personally in recent times, has found the time and the interest and the energy to come and be with us this week. Uh, we're very privileged and very uh, fortunate and glad uh, to have you with us, David. And you have uh, whetted my appetite, and I shared it with those who are here earlier in the week, uh, with the uh, wonderful three uh, addresses that we have to look forward to, of which the first, the title you've given us, is The Crown of Papacy in the English Hospice, 1483 to 1525, What Might Have Been History. And we are a little pressed for time this afternoon because of factors beyond our control. So I think we'll probably be holding uh, most of our discussion over tomorrow, uh, till tomorrow. But without further ado, with great uh, delight, David, we're in your hands for your first address. Well, I do actually. Is or are all microphones working? Yeah. Are we record? You are hearing me. Well, I'll go over here. If I may. So it's the habits of countless years lecturing that uh, you stand up and uh, you talk from a lectern with extensive notes. Right. Um, Jonathan, it's very good of you to invite me and I am uh, very flattered and also very surprised to be here is the best way of describing what I feel about this. And what I think I'd like to do is begin briefly by explaining why I'm here. What do I call myself? Um, well, many things, but the phrase that I've, I think is most useful in the context in which we are now, I'm a high church atheist. Um, <laughs> aren't most of you, but there we are. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the joke, of course, in Northern Ireland uh, is, is always to ask, you know, whether you're a Protestant high church or, or a Catholic or whatever. But I, why do I call myself that? I do because I've, I used to be a very plain and straightforward atheist. I used indeed to be rather active within the National Secular Society. It's not that I'm ashamed of that, but I think I've slightly grown out of it. In the same way that I think I've grown out of the, uh, the uh, intense libertarianism which characterized my appearances when I was on uh, some of the question times, but more particularly the moral maze in the 1990s. And I suppose what's happened is I've changed myself. And it was interesting enough, it was a London taxi driver. You don't often get L London taxi drivers who are philosophically literate. And, uh, uh, and he knew me and was saying, you know, what was I doing at the moment? And I said, well, I was peering on things like GB News, you know, very much conservative. Well, when, when I first encountered you, you were a libertarian. And I was then forced to think, which you're not often forced to do in a London cab, I was forced to think, why? I suppose I've become Burkean. I've become a believer in that. It's almost mystical, isn't it? There is that edge of mysticism, maybe sublime mysticism and nonsense in conservatism, that notion of a bridge across generations, of, of the contract of past, present, and future. I've also become, which is really why I'm here, and it's another Burkean idea, the Burkean idea that the human experience, the raw human experience, is too painful, too brutal. It's the kind of nakedness that needs drapery, that needs covering, that needs the covering of gentility, chivalry, civilization, tradition. So that's why I'm here. And I will fight as shy as possible 
of anything to do with faith. That's your expertise. It's not mine. What I want to begin with, and as Jonathan said, I am primarily a historian of the Tudor period. I've been, for many, for as long as I've really been doing anything, I have been nudging my way to a full biography of Henry VIII. And the more I research it, the more it seems to me extraordinary that the Reformation ever happened. Quite simply. Uh, And also that all the attempts that begin particularly with people like Scarisbrick but are embedded in the Catholic tradition of seeing Henry as somehow having gone wrong from the beginning. The attempt at seeing him as somebody who received a troubled upbringing, was kind of repressed teenager, was the profound, a profound disappointment to Lady Margaret Beaufort, had uh, you know, Bishop Fisher shaking his head over him and whatever. All this is complete and absolute nonsense. And, and total nonsense. Any notion that Henry is influenced by some sort of subterranean Erasmianism is nonsense, as is the idea of Erasmianism, as it's conventionally understood. It does not exist. Nobody, apart from Erasmus, in the early years of the 16th century, believes in the possibility of peace. Lots of people will play around with the idea for their own purposes, but the notion that there is an Erasmian tradition is preposterous. Similarly, the idea that somehow England is irresistibly detaching itself from Rome beforehand is equally silly. I want to present dramatically the opposite case, that what we see from 1483, and we'll come back to that date in a moment, I hope it will surprise you. Why don't I begin in 1485? And, and what, what we see from 1483 is something completely different. We see an intensification of relations between England and Rome. We see um, a increasing prominence of where you were yesterday, where we are, as it were, by proxy here. This is the, the summer school, as it were, of the English hospice, of the, the, the old hospice of, of St. Thomas and St. Edmund, um, uh, opposite Santa Maria della Rota, um, uh, as it still survives. We see an increasing royal intervention in that. We even see the beginnings of the idea that should be an, there should be an English curial cardinal. So let's begin this story by doing what you've been doing today, what I was doing in memory, which is wandering through Rome. And we can follow the footsteps of young Englishmen as they do this in the middle years of the 15th century. Because one of the things that is very striking is that apart from Wolsey, virtually everybody that you've heard of in the English church has up to a decade in Italy. There's an extraordinary intensification of Anglo-English relations, sorry, Anglo-Italian relations, in terms of the experience of, uh, of, of, um, of Italian universities, particularly Bologna and Padua. And remember what most of them are doing. They're not coming here, again, why I'm rather attracted to them, they're not coming here to study theology. The last thing you want to study if you're an ambitious young churchman is theology. You come here, of course, to do canon and civil law because you are ambitious and you know that that's how you're going to get on. And more importantly, if you don't get on, that's how you'll make money. Um, uh, so you come, and Bologna is, is one of the two great law schools. It's now being rivaled by Padua, but of course it's extraordinary. Padua is the, is, is the landlocked university of, of the Venetian Republic at that point. You have the Brenta Canal connecting the two, and very often a young Englishman will begin in Venice, and he will have had his money, because of course there is remittance of money. He'll have had his money remitted to Venice he will have his luggage sent there if he's lucky. Uh, we know quite a lot about some of them because the inevitably uh, you discovered you had problems on the plane, pro- problems of travel are universal, and very often the person who is supposed to be remitting your money and sending you luggage cheats you. So gener- <laughs> 10 years later, you have a case in Chancery, which means we as historians 500 years later can trace that unfortunate student experience when you arrive in Venice with no money and no luggage 
luggage and no contacts. And you know, God helps you if you're very, very lucky. So a couple of, of traps that I'm very interested in, which will quickly explain why we are actually looking at 1483. There's one man called John Sherbin, who is a northerner. All, virtually everybody I'm going to be talking about, like me, is a northerner. Uh, there's this extraordinary weight. The, the North, this is the terrible function, uh, the terrible problem with what the Tory government is trying to do at the moment, which is to refresh the economy of the North. Save in the 19th century, the North had a single purpose. It was to supply talent to the South. And, and the entire structures of Oxbridge were designed to bring this about with colleges like yours, Queen's, and so on, uh, being set up very, very much for that purpose. So the two Northerns I'm interested in, one is a man called John Sherbin. Uh, he is lucky enough to find himself at the, the receiving end of the patronage of a, uh, of a member uh, of a quasi-royal house of the Neville family, George Neville, Archbishop of York. He gets one of the great sort of things that a young man wants and he gets the uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in York Minster um, it's the uh, uh, it's, it's the canonry uh, 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 the, the canon stall of, is it Masham or Masham some of you will know some of you will know your Yorkshire better than I do but it was always regarded as the golden prebend it's the one with the largest income. So he's got an income. This is a young man who suddenly finds himself, through a good patron, having an income of two or three hundred pounds a year. And what does he do with it? He comes to Rome and he buys books. And he spends, agree we know exactly, he spends agreeable Saturday and Sundays wandering through the Roman streets and the booksellers, this newfangled thing called printing and buying books. And his books, by a circuitous process, finish up at Corpus Christi College, Oxford. So we know about Sherbin. Uh, and so Sherbin is here, uh, and I reasonably active around the papal court. Uh, the reason that this is so attractive is, of course, that everybody, both as governments and individuals, uh, all sorts of things require petitions to the papal court uh, for appointment to, uh, to, to every ecclesiastical office, but also many other matters, uh, all matrimonial matters, uh, many matters of contract and so on, finally finish up in Rome, which in many ways operates as a sort of international court as a European court, with, of course, extraordinary fees uh, being levied and so on. So Sherbin is here uh, in Rome uh, developing a very nice little job uh, as a royal proto-notary, uh, as well as enjoying himself buying books and clearly living a very agreeable life here. So he's one, uh, one kind of semi-ambitious young Englishman. Another much more important example, and born only a few miles from where I was, a man called Thomas Langton. And he's born in Appleby uh, in Westmoreland. Uh, he goes up to Cambridge, he's son of poor farming stock. Uh, he does extremely well. And he makes a friendship with somebody with the unlikely name Doggett. And even more to be an unlikely name, Doggett, he is a remote member of the royal family through a connection with the Boucher family. And the two of them clearly become close friends. Um, Langton uh, achieves a fellowship in the college, which has now vanished as part of the amalgamation that creates Trinity College, Cambridge. And they decide they're going to come and make their fortunes in Italy. And they, uh, again, it's that story uh, of, uh, of a nice amount of money that's remitted to Venice, lost luggage and all the rest of it, sued for later. Anyway, they settle down first in Bologna, then in Padua, spend 10 years here. Uh, and then finally, after having bought yet more books and yet more manuscripts, Langton also returns to England, where he becomes a leading royal clerk under Edward IV, and uh, extraordinarily involves himself in those of us who were uh, at the Castel, uh, Castel Gandolfo today. We looked at the papal court, and one of the officers of the papal court is the grand master of the papal household. And of course, similarly, in England, uh, the royal household was an elaborate and very well organized and very complex and lavish machine. And this young man from the north, fashioned and polished now, fluent in Italian, fluent in Latin, fluent in the, uh, in the Aristotelian culture of Padua and of Bologna, uh, in the idea of the Aristotelian mean and whatever, finds himself as a rapidly rising royal clerk. And this lad from the farm is responsible for redrafting the ordinances of the royal household with a grand Aristotelian introduction about it's important not to be too lavish and on the other hand not to be too mean. Instead you 
you want an equipoise, a perfect, sensible economy. Uh, he should really be running the country in Britain again, shouldn't he, um, uh, uh, between the two. Um, what does this young man become? He becomes the person who, if Richard III had remained king, would have ruled England. He becomes profoundly disillusioned by the behaviour of Edward IV. Edward IV finishes reign rather like Henry VII, with that graspingness, that meanness, that um, uh, avarice uh, in which the government becomes not for anything like a notion of the Commonwealth, but purely for the king, for the king's own benefit, for the king's own wealth. And he famously, Langton, is the young man who welcomed, the young man now, um, a bishop of St. Asa, a bishop, sorry, let, let me get this right, bishop, nominated bishop of St. David's, um, becomes touring with Richard in the north of England in 1483, the person who welcomes Richard as the best thing that ever happened to, to England, the king who embodied the possibility of reform, of decency, freedom, and whatever. What on earth does this have to do with my subject? He, by this stage, is rapidly emerging to the top of the Royal Council. If you look uh, at, we have the docket book, the actual record of what Richard's government does virtually on a day-to-day -day basis, and the first item of business that the, the, Richard is still Lord Protector at this point. He's not actually yet made himself king. One of the very first items of business on the first page is R.S. to become C. That is, sorry, J.S. Sorry, let me get that right. J.S. to become C. John Sherburn to become Cardinal. And bizarrely, when you think of everything else that Richard has to do, the largest single item of correspondence from King Richard is a series of letters to cardinals, to the Pope, to the college, to individuals like Cardinal Barbo, all saying, I want John Sherbin to be made a cardinal. Um, what is he, we, it is entirely unclear what he's thinking about. Why this sudden interest in having a curial cardinal? I think the guess, because this is going to be the, the theme of what I say, we've tended, obviously, as we do, because of our interests and how we, how we approach all this, we tend to think of Rome within some sort of spiritual or belief context. We would make far more sense even to include the divorce within the diplomatic context. These popes are primarily rulers. They are primarily rulers of an important territorial Italian principality. And what I think Richard is wanting to do is to use Rome as an ally against France. Relations between England and France at this, uh, this point are becoming very bad. Uh, uh, Edward IV had gone out of his way uh, to uh, normalize relations in their last stage. He received a lot, uh, the, the Treaty of Piquigny, gave him a large French pension. He's angling to marry the woman who actually becomes uh, Queen Elizabeth of, of England, Elizabeth of York of England. He's angling to marry her to the French Dauphin in what would have been an extraordinary marriage, extraordinary, bearing in mind the previous relations between England and France. And, and all that ruptures uh, uh, in, in, in the last years of Edward's reign and, and, and uh, Richard comes to the throne uh, uh, intending to reverse the whole of his brother's policies including that uh, of, of peace with France he wants to bring back something much more like the state of war of, of the earlier uh, 15th century uh, to uh, make sure that France does not control the whole of the Channel seaboard the risk at this point, remember, is France is very likely. France has defeated Burgundy. So it's going, France is now controlling most of the Belgian coast. It's controlling the whole of the northern coast because Normandy and everything else fell earlier in the 15th century. And it's now probably going to take Brittany as well. So the great risk is of that developing. So, but we all know, don't we, that Richard is going to be defeated. More interestingly is that move towards defeat, that move towards, uh, which of course they didn't know was going to end in defeat, the, the, the move towards Bosworth. 
What's going on? Well, you've got this campaign, which doesn't quite work, to get Sherban made a cardinal. Then the Pope dies, Pope Sixtus IV. He's the chap who builds the Sistine Chapel. Remember, you've got to recall what Rome is like at this point. Rome is, a, Rome is simply really a series of ruins. The papacy has only just returned from the Avignon captivity. Rome is a malarial-ridden swamp. And you get, these are the first Renaissance popes. They are aware of the imperial past. They're aware of the indignity of their present position. They're trying to reconstruct things architecturally, territorially, quasi-imperially. Uh, you'll remember the wonderful phrase of Thomas Hobbes, uh, that what is the papacy? It is nothing but the ghost of the Roman Empire sitting crowned upon the dunghill thereof. And, and they're trying to de-dunghill Rome. Uh, and the creation of the Sistine Chapel is one of them. Anyway, uh, Sixtus dies and there is a, 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 there's a very conflicted conclave and, 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 and uh, you, you, you get the election of, of Innocent VIII. And to that conclave, um, Sherban is actually acting as the guardian of the conclave. He's one of the guardians of the conclave. And very quickly, of course, now you've got a new pope, you need to render obedience. So Langton comes now bishop, uh, 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 now, uh, and now Bishop of Salisbury, comes to, a, to a, heading a major embassy to Rome, and he's in Rome in 1484. Presumably, this scheme for an English cardinal. Who else is in Rome? Well, as you all know, in 40, do we, do we all know? 1484, you've got the final stage of the conspiracy which is going to put Henry VII, we know they didn't, who is going to put Henry VII on the throne at the Battle of Bosworth. The key figure behind that conspiracy, apart from Henry himself in Brittany, uh, Lady Margaret Beaufort in London, is this extra another great ecclesiastic, John Morton, the patron of Thomas More and all the rest of it, who is in exile, who'd fled into it. He's a Bishop of Ely, and in the great Shakespeare scene uh, in Richard III, uh, at the moment when you're going to have the Lord Chamberlain executed on a log, uh, Hastings executed on a log, he is a Bishop of Ely who was sent off to, to get strawberries from his garden uh, by Richard and wisely flees in, eventually flees into exile uh, in the Netherlands. So this is the key moment of that conspiracy. What does John Morton do? He goes to Rome. So in Rome in 1484, on the eve of the Battle of Bosworth, 1484 to 85, on the eve of the Battle of Bosworth, you have the man who would have ruled England under the king if Richard had won the Battle of Bosworth. You also have the man who does rule England under the king when Henry VII does win the Battle of Bosworth. That's the centrality of Rome. What are they trying to do? Well, I, th I guess very much that Langton is part of this scheme to establish um, a, an English cardinalate. Uh, Morton is... is it's all been suspected, is trying to lay the grounds for the marriage uh, between Henry VII, the future Henry VII, Henry Earl of Richmond, and Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth of York, which of course is a problem because they are cousins and within the pro prohibited degrees. And, uh, and in other words, you will there have a, what will quickly amount to a battle for papal, in, papal intervention or non-intervention in a royal marriage, a situation that we'll be very familiar with indeed. So the beginning then of Henry VII's reign, uh, the end of Richard's reign, is this sense of a possibility of relations between England and Rome, which is close and closer. And based on the fact, as I said, all of these people have an Italian experience. Most of them have experienced the Roman court. Almost all of them, apart from the Oxbridge experience, they have an experience of Padua, Bologna, Ferrara, uh, or, 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 or whatever it is. And then there is again, and I don't want to go at this point too much into ordinary history, there is then the extraordinary episode of the marriage of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York uh, with, papal endow with papal endorsement. And indeed, the bull endorsing their marriage is the most explicit statement. Indeed, it's the foundation 
of the Shakespearean myth of the Union of the Roses. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that a papal bull supplies you with the legend of Shakespeare. It's the, in other words, it's the, it's the basis of, uh, it's, it's, it's the basis, uh, of, 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 of Edward Hall's chronicle, um, the union of the two noble houses of York and Lancaster, which itself is the underpinning of Shakespeare's great, great swathe of history plays. Even more strikingly, that bull is one of the very first to be translated into English by Bishop John Russell and published as a royal proc right at the beginning of 1485, right at the beginning of the process of printing in an official translation. And we have even the record of Henry VII's council uh, ordering the translation. B uh, Bishop Russell is the most intellectual bishop of the time, the best, best composer in English. Uh, we have the actual decision to propagate this bull. But of course, it's all eyewash. This bull is written in England. I think its date is falsified. We don't even know the actual date of the marriage of Henry VII and, um, and Elizabeth of York. The date of the 18th of January, I've demonstrated to be a total fiction. They are in official documents referred to as married from the beginning of December, which also has the enormous advantage of meaning that Henry VII and Elizabeth of York did not have premarital sex. Otherwise, it's impossible to account for the date of the birth of Prince Arthur. So <laughs> we're dealing then with a an extraordinary subterranean diplomacy that we do not fully understand and a manipulation of Rome that we don't really understand either. What we do know is immediately in the wake of this extraordinary series of documents, you get um, another one of these northerners, um, uh, wonderful name, isn't it? Christopher Urswick. Uh, Christopher Urswick, who's born a little bit to the west of where, where in Furness, uh, near, to, near to, to the modern baron Furness, he sent off to Rome uh, to do the dirty. So around then the um, around then the accession, this extraordinary remember this extraordinary accession of Henry the Seventh, a man with no claim to the throne at all. You use papal endorsement as the fundamental way in which it's propagated. Because those bulls, and then particularly after the Battle of Stoke, the first rebellion against him, those bulls provide the basic text the propagandistic text, because they are also accompanied by anathema um, against those who rebel. So you, you get everywhere, though these huge royal progresses, everywhere you'll get the leading bishops going, preaching to the papal bull and then pronouncing anathema, uh, you know, literally bell and book, recorded in town, city, cathedral, everywhere, as the, in other words, the alliance between England and Rome um, as, as the, the centerpiece for conveying legitimacy on the Tudors. All very close and all very cosy. And then, of course, relations drift apart, the complexities of politics in Italy, the complexities of what Henry VII is doing, his relations with Spain, and all the rest of it. Um, Henry VII's policy, which had begun by being also uh, very, very pro-French, drifts in and out of, of being pro-French and whatever, but finishes up somewhere very, very much like uh, the policy of Edward IV, um, a policy, that's to say, in which the English claim on France is bought off with a gigantic pension, and Henry VII instead starts to establish a series of cosy relationships with all surrounding European powers that are based on a peace, but be a guarantee that you won't support rebels because Henry's claim to the throne is so weak. And I tried to, I tried to explain in my old days to my students why on earth there are so many rebels against Henry VII. You may remember them. They all have very implausible names, which are like Perkin Warbeck and whatever, uh, one, wonderfully satirized uh, in 1066 and all that. How is it that, 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 that these strange people, royal scullions and whatever, um, tailors, from, uh, tailors from the North Netherlands, are taken to impersonate a royal prince? I think the explanation is that because Henry VII had such an improbable claim to the throne, people thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. 
It's a bit like the office of prime minister in the last few years. You know, um, once once you've had the kind of person who's held it, um, uh, you know, once Theresa May was elected, it was clear it was an office for which there are no qualifications whatever. So there is then this, this there is then this extraordinary process, and I think it's very very similar uh, in terms of, of birth, not intelligence, in Henry the Seventh's case. Um, then there's an extraordinary shift, and this is the mo- so. We've, we've had that first moment under Richard in 1483, continued forward by Henry VII in 1485, in which there's sudden, really serious interest in Rome, in which the royal, uh, in, in which the king in England starts to intervene in the affairs of the hospice, in which there was an ambition under uh, uh, Richard III to have an English cardinal, to have an English curial cardinal. Because, of course, the, the two other great European the other, at this moment, two great European powers um, are France and of, of the incipient Spain, the, the, the union of, of Ferdinand and Isabella, do have curial cardinals and do manipulate uh, papal, papal elections. And clearly, uh, if England were to resume its position, which, remember, it had held at the Council of Constance at the beginning of the 15th century as a dominant European power, you have to have a place uh, in Rome. 1504, though, there's an extraordinary shift, and this is the moment at which I think we begin to move into a story that we can actually comprehend. Again, it's a shift of papal reigns. Um, the, uh, the, the Borgia Pope, Alexander VI, has just died. The della Rovere Pope, Julius II, the warrior Pope, has just been elected. In England, it's the moment at which the 13-year-old future Henry VIII goes to his father's court, and he finds a very different world. The world of the end of Henry VII's reign suddenly shifts, and the papacy is absolutely central to this process. Because what Henry VII wants from the papacy at this point are two things. One of them we all know about, and everybody has understood it perfectly. He wants another bull from Rome, which will enable uh, his second son to marry the widow of his eldest son, because Prince Arthur has just died. And so there is a negotiation conducted by, of course, there are no English cardinals. You instead have Cardinal Adrian Adriano Castellesi acting as English agent uh, uh, in, in Rome. And it's his wonderful correspondence that enables us to trace what's going on. The new pope, of course, is a little bit shy. It's very difficult to imagine uh, Judas II as being a little shy, but uh, Adriano says you know, he's really a bit hesitant and he's not dealing with these things very quickly uh, or competently, but, you know, give him time. He still has this wonderful phrase, he's fresh to the job, you know. He's not yet quite sure uh, how things are done or what are to be done. So that's one deal. There's a deal that's needed, uh, rather di- because remember, most good opinion was that, uh, that Prince Henry should not have been allowed to marry Catherine of Aragon. The main weight of, uh, of canon law opinion, and including that of William Warren, the Archbishop of Canterbury in England, was that this was probably a bad idea, and in any case she was rather shop soil goods and, 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 and so on. So there's, there's a bit of a problem about that. But interestingly, the major problem is about Henry VII's other request. Henry VII wants, and this again gives us an extraordinary insight into what's going on, and this is the first time, and probably the last time, I'm going to mention anything spiritual. Henry VII wants a special bull called an indult that would enable him to choose his own father confessor. One of the things that's most remarkable in the developments in this period is English kings using Franciscans as confessors. At exactly the moment that the monarchy is becoming most visibly visibly selfish, self-aggrandizing, the the development of the private role of the king with the chamber, with bastard feudalism, with huge increase of personal royal wealth, with with law-breaking, with Empson and Dudley, it's exactly the moment that they are choosing confessors who are most vividly aware 
of the problems of wealth, of selfishness, and, and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, Henry has been having problems with his confessor, and he wants a new one. And the Pope makes a great deal of fuss about the king's right to choose exactly who he wants. And then finally, a deal is done. And it's typical as how we all know Italy works now. Uh, Castellesi goes with this, it's now turned into a bundle of about four or five bulls. He goes to the Pope, he explains the situation to him, and the Pope says, absolutely impossible. This really cannot be done. Castellese goes away. The following day, there is a knock at Castellese. By the way, his magnificent palace, still with the English royal arms on it, uh, is in the, what is it called, the, the Via della Con uh, Conciliazione? It's still there, his palace is there, which incidentally is where uh, Alexander VI had died in the garden, probably poisoned by Castellese on behalf of, of Julius II, who's favoured him. You're getting the general flavour of all of this. Anyway, a messenger arrives at this ele very elegant and noble palace with a request. The Pope is desperately keen that his nephew, Guidovaldo, the Duke of Urbino, be made a Knight of the Garter. To which, of course, Adriano, who understands the game completely, says, absolutely impossible. <laughs> Unthinkable. These things never happen, not even the greatest of Italian princes. And then they settle down over a drink and they decide that two impossibles equal one possible. And so, so, so <laughs> Guido Baldo, who, by the way, um, is, is, uh, the, uh, he's a, he's, he's the son of a great condottieri. Uh, he is the man who becomes the captain general of the papal armies despite impotence and, and a complete failure uh, of, military, of serious military activity. But, you know, such are these things. Anyway, he gets his knighthood of the garter, which also is a wonderful consequence that it brings Castiglione to England. Baldassare Castiglione, the author of the Book of the Garter, who actually watches the young Henry in action at court and includes him in the apparatus of, 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 of the Book of the Courtier, so that, that, that consequence. Uh, so he gets his, uh, uh, um, Guidovaldo gets his KG, uh, uh, Castiglione comes to be installed in England um, uh, uh, on his behalf by proxy at Windsor, and Henry VII gets his bulls, and he gets this extraordinary... Um, uh, indulgence, uh, 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 able to choose, uh, to, to choose his own confessor, and he chooses a man called Etienne Baron, Stephen, Stephen Baronius, whatever he is, another Frenchman. Most of the people who are close to Henry uh, are French, um, and uh, it is Stephen Barons operating in very close alliance with John Fisher, who stage manages the deathbed of Henry the Seventh. But that's yet another lecture. This closing this, this, this increasing closeness to Rome also has an important component of foreign policy. France now, thanks to peace with England. Remember, English historians do not understand why England is so important in a European politics that focuses essentially on Italy. Why is the Pope interested in England? This is the period of the Italian Wars from 1496 when Charles VIII of France is called in by the Pope by, and, and by Milan uh, to, as it were, redress the balance of power in Italy and an extraordinary series of wars that last to the Battle of Pavia uh, in 1525, uh, which is my terminal date. Um, why, is, why are the Italians, in, why are the Venetians, partly it's trade, London is at that point the great trade, already the great trading metropolis of the north. It's where the Venetian galleys go to Southampton. Uh, the, the stuff is taken often directly. The galley will then go round into London before it goes on to Antwerp. Uh, there are huge factories uh, of Florentine merchants, of, of Lucchese and whatever. London, a major, major, major trading centre. The, again, uh, the, the wealth of the Medici, so much of it depends on the cloth trade uh, down and so on and so on. But it's another very simple fact that we forget. England is a very, very long way from Rome, but it's very near Paris. If you have the French seeing their future power essentially in controlling either Lombardy, Duchy of Milan, and Naples, or both, the possibility of English intervention can scupper 
the very best laid French plans because it's only a couple of hundred miles from Calais where there's a heavily fortified uh, English bridgehead to Paris. You can scupper the whole thing. And so, so much of what I'm talking about now depends on that fact that English historians have simply forgotten for generations, although, of course, contemporaries understood it. Henry VII is very aware, despite his very close personal relations with Louis XII of France, they'd actually been together when they were both princes in France uh, in 1483, and, and so on. They knew each other personally, they were fond of each other, but Louis is becoming immensely powerful. There's this process, France, remember, in the Middle Ages, is simply a geographical expression. It's now becoming hugely powerful in the wake of the failure of the English in the Hundred Years' War, the intense consolidation of the French monarchy, it shifted into being a full-scale absolute monarchy, particularly in the reign of Louis XI and so on, and a France that's consolidating internally, that thanks to the marriage of Louis XII and Anne, Duchess of, Bergen, uh, D- Duchess of Brittany, has now assumed pretty much its modern frontiers and is now aggressively advancing in particularly North Italy, because Louis XII also had a claim. Uh, he de- he de- he de- he's got a Visconti title. He-, he descends from the Visconti, which were one of the ruling ducal families of Milan. So he's got a title there, as well as an- another claim, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the uh, uh, claim, claim to Naples. Uh, and he's able to make the claim to Milan good. So Henry VII is becoming terribly aware of the overwhelming power of France. What does he do? He starts deliberately to patronise the House of Habsburg. And this again is something that I've discovered and that I'm delighted about. In the last far three, four years of his reign, 60% of royal revenue is spent on bribing the Habsburgs. <laughs> it's totally extraordinary. He's deliberately creating a counterweight power to France that is to be used in alliance with Rome. This is the, Rome is increasingly terrified now of French pressure coming down, the, the, the relations between the papacy and Louis XII are deteriorating and they will, they will turn into open warfare pretty soon. And so England then is suddenly starting to play this extraordinarily important part. Um, the um, the story of the uh, uh, of, 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 of the Archduke Philip and whatever is uh, shipwrecking in England and so on. We we will have to leave out this. It's a very good story. Um, the this process develops uh, and develops rapidly. Um, Henry. Uh, Again, a very quick summary of, of, of the position of the Habsburgs. It is the uh, the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, Maximilian, um, uh, who is a very strange and extraordinary man, uh, has a series of unbelievably ambitious marriages, all of which work. So he himself marries the heiress of Burgundy. The heir of that marriage, the Archduke Philip, marries uh, Joanna the Mad of, of, of Spain, of Castile, and she becomes an heiress of Spain. It's just extraordinary. And, uh, and the son of that marriage, future Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, then inherits the lot, complete with all the claims in Italy and all the claims to the New World. You get the creation of this vast um, Habsburg conglomerate, which is what confronts Henry, Henry VIII, my Henry, when he comes to the throne in 1509. He's, he's, he himself had been present um, in 1506 when the Archduke Philip is shipwrecked in England, uh, having received £100,000 in cash. Entire royal revenues are £110,000. He receives one year's entire revenue in silver pennies to finance his voyage to claim the throne of, uh, claim the throne of Castile after the death of, of, of Queen Isabella of Castile. Instead, en route, he is shipwrecked. He's driven to shore uh, in the far west of England. He is effectively uh, under... Uh, uh, I suppose, arrest. Um, uh, he, he, he is effectively a prisoner. And the person who's sent to bring him 
to court the person who takes him to see the table of King Arthur, the alleged round table of King Arthur at Winchester, is Hen- the future Henry VIII, is Prince Henry. Um, and he wit- Henry is actually present at this extraordinary dinner which is held at Windsor, um, in which the new treaty between the, uh, England and the, the House of Habsburg is, is so, it's so modern, is celebrated over dinner. Uh, Henry VII says to Philip and to his son, uh, and to his son Henry, I'm going to have this table inscribed to commemorate this event, just like the round table uh, at Windsor, uh, at, 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 uh, at Winchester. So Henry then is, is a child of this, this shift towards an aggressive pro Habsburg policy that is designed to renew war with France. Unfortunately, Henry VII doesn't seem to have told anybody else that this was his intention. What is one of the striking things about royal policy, and we've learned the same thing, is politicians very often pursue utterly contradictory goals at the same time. You will have two royal policies. So there's on the one hand a public policy of peace with France, with huge pensions not just being paid to the king, but to every leading member of the royal council. So you have an enormous interest of the royal council uh, in maintaining peace with France. On the other hand, you have the young Henry VIII, who's been brought up in the world of Castiglione, who's been brought up in that world of scholar and gentleman. That notion of, on the, I'll be talking about convention and whatever, that sense of serious education, Latinate education on the one hand, but also combined with, with jousting, wrestling, all je- the, the, the complete public school curriculum, which is what, 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 what Castiglione uh, is really about. And of course, seeing war as the natural occupation of a king, the right thing you should do, and fighting French, the French, of course, as the right thing you should do. But Henry finds himself against this profound opposition of his council. Where does the support for war come from? You've got the the high nobles. I mean, families um, like the Talbots, uh, the Earls of Shrewsbury and whatever, who have been leading lights of the Hundred Years' War are now bribed up to the neck by the French and clamouring to maintain peace with France. Where does support for war come from? You lot. It comes from the clergy. The leading... This, again, is the most extraordinary thing. If you look at the usual accounts of the reign of Henry VIII, and I'm afraid accounts, some of them have the name D. Starkey attached to them. Again, it's very important to recognise where your work goes wrong. I described my my sort of political conversions, and it's very important to recognise where your early work is wrong and not to deify what you wrote when you were a 20-year-old, 20-odd-year-old. And uh, I use, I, like everybody else, talked about a war party. I envisaged an English aristocracy red in tooth and claw, eager to renew the the glories of the Hundred Years' War. Not a bit of it. Every leading noble on the King's Council, with the possible exception of the Earl of Surrey, he's the man who'll become Duke of Norfolk, Howard's, is passionately in favour of peace with France. Why the shift? Julius II, Louis XII. There is a tremendous outbreak of hostilities between the Pope and the King of France. Needless to say, it's because they've fallen out over another territorial dispute. They came together um, uh, 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 in the League of Cambrai to dismember the Republic of Venice. They come very near to doing it, but then, of course, what they do is they quarrel over the spoils. The result is, and uh, uh, the result is, is o- very much open warfare between the two. But how is this process being handled by the English in Rome? For the first and the last time, there is an English curial cardinal, and you all saw his tomb. It's the tomb of Cardinal Bainbridge, Christopher Bainbridge, which is the most beautiful object in the English College. And Bainbridge is again, it's an extraordinary story. Who is Bainbridge's patron? Thomas Langton. Where does Bainbridge come from? The North. Which is his archbishopric? The archbishop, all of this. And he is sent by Henry, almost certainly without conciliar approval, to Rome to conduct a totally another independent foreign policy against the king's council to bring about war 
between England and France. And he does it so well, he actually becomes, um, uh, he, you wouldn't know it from that magnificent tomb, but he, become, he becomes uh, uh, the, the, the favorite, the papal favorite of Julius II. Uh, he, be, he, he becomes papal pre- prefect of the armies. He is the man who actually leads the papal defense of the unsuccessful papal defense of Bologna. And uh, so he, he, he is profoundly active uh, at, Active round the Pope in this this tremendous struggle with Louis the Twelfth. Um, the uh, Louis the Twelfth, I'm afraid, wins. Um, and it's just very important that we realise what Louis the Twelfth does. He has defeated the Pope in battle. He's come within a whisker of actually capturing Julius the Second. What's the first thing he does? He organises a general council to um, uh, dethrone. Uh, to dethrone Julius, so you have a council at Pisa, uh, which which is which is a schism, according to the Pope, a schismatic council. It's also important to remember that um, Louis XII, by this point, has divorced his first wife, so he can div- he can marry the the Duchess of Burgundy. Eventually, Henry, using this, is able to persuade the English Parliament to war. Who leads the? approach to the Parliament, Erasmus's principal English patron, William Warham, Archbishop of Canterbury. And Erasmus lies through his teeth. This is Erasmus propagating the ideas of peace. This is Erasmus in Cambridge, he's at Queen's at this point, in complete um, secret correspondence with, with Armonio, who is the King's Latin secretary, this, he's accumulating the materials that will lead to the great, to the great work, Julius Exclusus, you know, Julius shut out of heaven uh, because of the wickedness of, of his policies. Erasmus knows exactly what is going on. You will not find a word of William Warham's role despite the fact it is Warham who organises the translation. Again, cast your mind back to that papal bull the, in, in, in 1485. It is, it is Warham who does exactly the same exercise. He has Julius's brief in which he describes the pathetic sufferings of the papacy at the hand of this wicked schismatic king of France who is worse than a Turk. You invoke crusade, all of this. It's all put into passionate English. Um, we have the actual text that's read in Parliament. Uh, Warham goes into both houses of Parliament, 1512. This pathetic text is read. The Parliament weeps and mourns and votes taxes, and you get war. Not a word of it. So, in other words, the war party is the church. And it is the the church in England supporting Rome for purely foreign policy reasons. It um, there can be no can, can be no uh, and what what is also striking. I mean, Warren is one of the very best churchmen of the period. You know, hence his patronage of Erasmus and whatever. One of those who's most sensitive. Um, one of those um, who, uh, who had, uh, whose appointment in 1504 was a conscious act of reform. Remember, Henry VII is being a good boy at this point. But the, the thing that drives war at this point, the, sorry, the thing, thing that drives this intensely close union between England and Rome is foreign policy. But it results in something extraordinary, doesn't it? Henry VIII's first war, he is is fought under the papal flag. When the English invade France uh, in, 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 in 1513, they march under the papal flag. The Scots mock them as papal eunuchs. Um, uh, at sea, and then, of course, a very unpleasant revenge is taken against the Scots, which we won't discuss. Um, uh, uh, The the, uh, Henry VIII denounces his fellow king, denounces Louis XII as heretic and schismatic and worse than Turk, and it's a crusade. So this is the king who, 20 years later, is going to break with Rome. And exactly this same pattern just looking at my watch, exactly this same pattern will repeat itself in the early 1520s. In the early 1520s, you get a sudden intensification of relations between England and Rome. But the thing, the thing that had been most important about 1509 is that you had an English resident cardinal who is a papal favourite. So you get a 
completely different level of relations between England and Rome. Why, why then, in 1523, is it that you send a bishop, you send John Clark and Richard Pacey, who, by the way, were protégé of Bainbridge? So you have this complete succession of northerners who've stars at Oxbridge, gone to Padua, gone to, gone to, um, uh, gone to Bologna and whatever, acting as English agents in Rome. But why, why, why aren't they, isn't one of them made a cardinal? Why isn't there an English resident cardinal? The answer is the catastrophe of Wolsey. Wolsey thinks that he can manage Rome at one remote. And I think this is the essential failure of what goes on. You don't build on this history. You don't cement this history. You don't embed it institutionally. It's an occasional one. It's an occasional series of approximations which, um, which, 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 which do, not, do not entrench themselves fully. But it is still important to understand how extraordinary it is. The John Clark um, who, who becomes Bishop of Bath and Wells, uh, the, the English resident in Rome, at yet another period of, of intense anti-French activity, of very close alliance with the Emperor Charles V. What had his first mission to Rome been? Obviously he'd been there with Bainbridge, but what's his first mission to Rome in 1521? Why would he go to Rome, gentlemen, in 1521? Shame on this is the Assotio Septem Sacramentorum, because Henry doesn't just fight twice as a papal crusader. He also is the only king who actually writes against Luther. And the Assotio, which he genuinely does semi-right, he, he assembles it, uh, the polishing is done by Thomas More, this magnificent um, uh, uh, um, copy of it is made uh, uh, for presentation to the Pope. Uh, of course, print is important, and it is in print, but if you want a superior manuscript, what you do is you, you, you sorry, if, if you want a superior copy, uh, you write it elaborately uh, in, 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 uh, in calligraphy, uh, in italic text, on the finest of parchment, uh, uh, it's bound in silk and heaven only knows what else, and verses in Henry VIII's own, Latin verses in Henry VIII's own hand, uh, dedicate it. <laughs> To, 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 to Leo X. Now, cannot we see what this looks like as a pattern? This is a king who fights for Rome. This is a king who writes for Rome. Not only that, the man who is responsible for the, um, for, uh, 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 for the Assertio Sept uh, Septem Sacramentorum is yet another northerner, is Cuthbert Tunstall, who is going to become Bishop of Durham, and uh, in in fifteen um, in, in fifteen twenty twenty one, uh, uh, when 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 you get the Diet of Worms and all the rest of it, he is actually ambassador to Charles V, and again an extraordinary backstory which also involves Erasmus. He had been Erasmus's principal assistant. Uh, in those years in England, what had Erasmus been doing? And he's on the one hand observing the horrors of the, the shift to war, the renewal of universal war, which uh, he so deplores and curses Julius II for. What is Erasmus actually doing? He is putting together the Novum Instrumentum, the new edition, uh, of the new Greek edition of the New Testament with the radical Latin translation. And who is his principal assistant? It is Cuthbert Tunstall. And Tunstall then is this immensely able young ling linguist. He's also an arithmetician. He writes a very important treatise on maths. And is this extraordinary observer uh, of, the, of the imperial diet at Worms. And he writes one of the great dispatches of all time uh, to Henry uh, and to Wolsey. Uh, this is just before Luther does Here I Stand. Unfortunately, he's just left when Luther does that. It would have been wonderful to have had his reaction to that. But he's just got a copy of Luther's latest pamphlet, The Babylonian Captivity. And with his extraordinary shrewdness and intelligence, he immediately grasps the two things about it, one is the attack on the number of the sacraments and the basis of that attack of sola scriptura, that only three sacraments, uh, 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 communion, baptism, and possibly penance, can possibly have a direct scriptural foundation, uh, he, 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 which of course provides the basis 
of, the, uh, uh, of Henry's book, but he does something else. He understands immediately the importance of both printing uh, and of the vernacular. Um, uh, so Henry is warned on that. And what Henry does on the basis of that, England is the first country and by far the most ses- successful to start off with to operate a directly organised, inspired campaign of preaching and teaching against Luther. Um, And who is in charge of it? The intellectual in charge of it is Bishop Fisher, who is Henry's favourite clergyman at this point, and who is responsible for acting as Minister of Police, Thomas More. So this is the world into which the Reformation breaks. Why? Lust. There is a single explanation, which is Henry's lust for Anne Boleyn. There is no other reason at all for Henry to change. And why can't Henry get what he wants from Rome? Politics. He chooses the worst possible moment to do it. I can demonstrate that Henry and Anne pledged to marry on New Year's Day 1527. I can do it precisely because the letter in which Henry acknowledges Anne's gift, in which she surrenders herself to him, survives. It's in French, and it describes the gift as une traine. Latin strena means New Year's Day gift. It means nothing else. There's only one New Year's Day it can be, which is 1527. Unfortunately, what happens a little later in 1527? The sack of Rome. Who sacks Rome? The troops of the Holy Roman Emperor. And at that point, the Pope is an imperial prisoner. And the the, the new biography uh, of Charles V has come up with the evidence. The Cardinal last night was getting very cross with me for the number of people that Henry VIII killed in England. I bit my tongue and refrained from explaining to him that it was the Holy Roman Emperor who sacked Rome in scenes that would have disgraced the Nazis, held the Pope prisoner, and had instructed um, his captain general, the Duc de Bourbon, the rebellious Duc de Bourbon, who who dies on the eve of it all, um, instructed him to take the Pope alive or dead, and if alive, to bring him to Spain. And it was Erasmus's favourite pupil, who happened to be the emperor's Latin secretary, who wrote a justification of the sack of Rome, which says what a pity it hadn't been worse, because the Pope had brought it on himself. So, do we see, and do we see what Henry's psychology is? This is a king who had done more for Rome than any other monarch. Henry has got an extraordinarily simple Old Testament morality. You scratch my back and I scratch yours. And you read the correspondence and fundamentally that is what it's about. So there is, but I think the background to it all is ironically this increasing proximity because of diplomacy which produces this this intense sense of rejection, hatred once it's denied. And, of course, the knowledge that you know, Louis XII, with much less of a case, had been able to get away with it, able to get away with divorce. So we need, we need a much more realistically rooted approach to this. And it seemed to me to be very wonderful that you were basing yourself round the English College, where all of this happens, where all of these people that I've been talking about, where Langton, where Erswick, where Bainbridge, where Clark, all were, you were there. Bainbridge is lying there. That history is, mani- history is in Rome, barely beneath your feet. Thank you.
what you've done so many things, but what you've done is you've, is you've coloured in, uh, as you said right at the end, where, where we are now and where we've been with that absolutely vivid, um, as if it were all happening uh, yesterday. Um, it was. It's only, yeah. five, it's only 500 years ago. And, um, <laughs> and, and, of course, you've, you've, here we are, and that, that very interesting distinction that you drew right at the beginning, as it were, between, you know, well, you do the spiritual, and I'm the historian, but, of course... The, the, the distinction between them would be would be wrong to drive to drive the absolute distinction because as we try and engage spiritually, we need always to be pulled back from myth making and over romanticisation with that extraordinary uh, uh, historical account that you've given us. And if I may say just one final personal reflection of mine, uh, what makes your um, delivery so compelling is your extraordinary gift of uh, bringing alive the connection of persons. And, and all the ways in which you've been able to trace for us, well, so and so was there, was assistant to him, was working. That, that I think, is, is just a, a tremendous gift. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask everyone else to um, percolate with what we've heard overnight, uh, because we have been squashed for time today, and we've got lots of time tomorrow for discussion and reflection and question and continuing of the conversation. But of course, you can continue the conversation over drinks and dinner and so on and so forth. But I think we won't have any formal question time this evening. Uh, we'll give you um, a few minutes for another comfort break or whatever. We'll try and get to chapel for evening prayer as close to six o'clock as we can and for uh, the mass, which we'll, um, uh, and then we'll have um, uh, supper with uh, Cardinal Casper. But uh, David, you've just given us the most um, uh, exhilarating beginning. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you.